So I'm Hoi. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at HoiTab, H-O-I-T-A-B. And this is Frank, tech lead for engineering lead for uh, Android Emulator. Hello. Cool. Um, I thought before we start, I would just like to uh, highlight some of the improvements that we've made uh, since Google I.O. Uh, on the Android Emulator. In particular, three different features that we have launched. So the first one is uh, multi-display. The second one is Google Maps integration. It sounds a lot more exciting when you see it. Um, and then last but not least, ARM emulation, something brand new that we want you to try. So the first one is multi-display. At Google I.O., a lot of you would have seen our new enhancement to enable foldable testing. And this is really taking it to the next level. You can attach up to three external displays to the uh, Android emulator so you, that you can now basically check out what your apps look like uh, in those particular devices. Second, and this is my favorite feature of Google Maps integration. So previously, when you're trying to get somewhere with your uh, Android emulator, you need to know the latitude and longitude, and then you need to look it up and type it in you know, really long number that I have to say is not that intuitive to me. Uh, but now, you could just go in and just like you search for any location on Google Maps, and it will take you right there. And it doesn't just stop there as well. The second thing that it does, if you tell me two locations, it can actually plot the route, and you can play it back up to five times the speed. So now there is no more excuse not to test your location-based app in the Android emulator. Yay. <laughs> Last but not least, the ARM emulation. So at first I go, hey, is this only for games developer? Actually, a lot of you told us not. So a lot of you have got uh, ARM native libraries that you want to test. Uh, before you go uh, onto physical device. And this is now available under the Canary channel, under Android P, 32-bit. Uh, so we would really love for you to uh, check it out and give us feedback on this brand new feature. And with that, I would like to hand it to Frank for some live demos. <laughs> yeah, let's switch over to the demo machine. Okay, so I have opened over here. Uh, uh, multi-display um, version of the emulator is running Android Q. There's one extra display that has been created. I will demonstrate the UI in a bit more detail. So uh, we're allowed to press this button to add secondary displays. And um, basically uh, how this UI currently works is, um, well, let's just first get some of the uh, multi-display related um, things you can do on the emulator here out of the way. So you can open uh, apps in one window or, or another, and they can all run at the same time. So um, one of the things I like to point out is that you can not only pre pick from a preset um, set of resolutions, like you have 480p up to 4K, but you can also change the DPI. So one of the side effects of having this multi-display UI, um, aside from being able to add and remove displays, is you can also uh, change the DPI, and so I can, for example, I can change the DPI from 420, which is what the current um, device is defaulting to, uh, to 240. Then I can apply changes, and um, the system will update dynamically. So, for example, if I launch a different app, like say maybe Contacts, uh, let's see, um, yeah, um, maybe I press it again, but. Uh, uh, it's basically the, the side effect of having multi-displays is that we dynamically adjust all the aspects of a display without having to take another snapshot or reboot the emulator or, or anything like that. So just wanted to put that out there. And so that's it for the multi-display feature that I wanted to talk about. And the next thing is the Google Maps integration. So in recent versions of the Canary emulator, you'll now have a Google Maps UI that replaces the old location UI. So you know, old location UI, you had a field to enter the latitude and longitude and add uh, points from a GPX or KML file. However, we now have a Google Maps um, browser running in the emulator here. It operates in two modes, single points and routes. So in single point mode, um, you can press on a point and you can set the location. So for example, I want to go all the way into the middle of the bay, I can set that location. If I ask um, Google Maps, what? Oh, OK. Has to ask for permission. All right, fine. Uh, there you go. I'm in the middle of the bay, and I can like 
go really fast over here. Um, the other mode of operation, well, by the way, all these single points can be saved and played back later. The other mode of operation is really cool. It's the routes. So I've set this up in two places. So I have this navigation from Shoreline Park to um, 1600 Amphitheater Parkway, which is Googleplex. And I can play back this route. And while it's playing back, suddenly my location is here. But this enables us to do something else, which is I can follow the same route um, inside the emulator itself. So in the emulator, the Google Maps is now thinking I'm navigating when we haven't even stepped outside. So this is a great way to test apps that rely on map data. And you can easily set a route and then play it back. In addition, you can increase the playback speed to 5x. So I'll just try that again. And uh, usually, Google Maps doesn't expect you to go this fast on this road. Um, so um, it'll, it'll, look, it'll look a little janky, but um, it's, um, it's definitely working. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's it for the Google Maps API. So we want to. Uh, stop this now, I guess. And then there's another thing that I want to demonstrate, which is the ARM translation. So previously, if you ran into an app like this, this is the endless tunnel sample that contains a lot of native code. So the, there's an entire game written in C++. So all the game state and all the game loop is running there. And what if I just compile it only for ARM? What will happen? Well, in the recent uh, Canary channel, there's uh, images of Android P, system images, that uh, give you both x86 and ARM ABI compatibility in the same system image. This is done by leveraging binary translation technology um, by Google. This translation technology is much faster than the ARM system images that do full system emulation. So to demonstrate, I can pick between these. So you'll notice that. The ABDPARM, it's the P image that has ARM and x86 in one. I, I can deploy it, but the other device that I've been running Q, it'll say that it supports x86, but APK only supports ARM. And so um, it'll, the device chooser already notices that we're potentially running something that is compatible with ARM. So we'll just uh, try to build this. Let's see. Okay. Build. All right, go. Yeah, it, and it's working, and it's usually, it's running a lot faster than typical for ARM system images, and it's much closer to what we expect from x86 emulator. Yeah, so that's it for the uh, first round of demos. Back Ooh. to the slides. Yay! Thanks. Excellent. And now on to the main event that you're all here for, continuous integration testing. So when we uh, look at this problem, uh, we thought of basically two uh, different aspects of uh, the challenges that you face in a continuous integration environment. The first one is um, what we call deployability. You want the correct version of the emulator, of the system image deployed, and make the test reproducible, make the environment completely uh, contained. And the second one is debuggability. So I don't know about you, but my code have a lot of bugs. When things inevitably go wrong, I want to find out basically what's going on, and there are new tools that is available to you. So uh, earlier this month, we published uh, a couple of uh, scripts on, uh, on GitHub that would uh, help you basically build your, your own uh, testing environment. And there are three aspects uh, to those tools in terms of deployability. The first one is a script to help you download the latest version uh, of the Android system image all the way from Android Lollipop and up. The second aspect is to help you download the correct version of the Android emulator in both Canary and Stable. And last but not least, we have a tool now to basically help you publish a uh, Docker image that contains both. So you can always go back to it and reproduce uh, your tests. 
As I said before, at the moment, the uh, system image and emulator are only available with the latest version. Um, you can, of course, download it and basically you know, put it in a docking image for your, uh, for your own environment. But what we actually want to do uh, going forward um, is to actually enable you to download legacy versions of both so that you can reproduce even historical tests. Um, so, you, so uh, yeah, you get more reproducibility with your testing. Second aspect is debuggability. So the, there are two tools that are available to you when you deploy uh, the remote instances of the emulator. The first one that we all know and love is ADB, yay! So you can kick off your test with ADB, of course, and you can get you know, lockhead messages. But what if you know, those doesn't quite describe it? You know, we have all done it before. We just do, hey, more lock doc D and just see what happened. But actually, there's a new tool that's available. And we've worked together with, the, uh, with our web team uh, to enable WebRTC uh, remote streaming of your emulator. So now you can actually see what's going on with your emulator if things go wrong. With that, let's switch over to the demo and see how it works in practice. So this demo will start by just introducing where these container scripts live. So uh, if you go to GitHub, slash um, Google slash Android emulator container scripts with dashes in between, then you're going to get to this uh, where we maintain these scripts. So basically, these scripts are structured as a way to generate Docker images easily. This includes the complete workflow from where do I even get an emulator in a system image, download them from the SDK, package them together in Docker image, expose ADV ports, and get WebRTC streaming working. So there are some requirements, um, like Python, and eventually you want ADB at some point to communicate with the device. However, uh, we, we do know that there, there, is, there is a special requirement of requiring KVM acceleration. We're aware that some users um, aren't able to um, do that. But uh, this is, we're, we're going to work on that later. But mainly, this is for if KVM acceleration is available. So. Uh, the scripts work um, through this emu docker interface. So I type emu docker dash h. Uh, it'll come with a set of commands. They're mainly around listing where to find the downloads and, and creating the emulators. So if I type emu docker list, I get a dynamically generated list of all of the currently released uh, system images and emulators in the stable and canary channels. So this is not hard coded. This is based off of the same data source that describes uh, the current version of the emulator and system images in the SDK manager. So this will always be updated every time you run it. We're also aware, though, that some users want to be able to freeze a particular version of the emulator or system image. and. We know we haven't really put that in yet, but we do plan to do that. We know it's valuable. Um, anyways, so after you get a list of downloads, there's this convenience script called Emu Docker Interactive, where it gives you a menu um, listing all of the possible downloads. You enter a number. So, for example, you can enter 43 if you want to download the API 29 image and 2 to pick the Canary emulator. I happened to download those already, so it cached it, and uh, the Docker image is being created. This can take a while, um, but then lo lots of things happen to cache this time around, so it's almost done. But uh, when you do this, uh, we create a Docker image that will contain all of the necessary dependencies on, on Linux um, for the emulator. Uh, this can be often hard without Docker because sometimes you run it on some Linux machines versus others that have different sets of system libraries. It can be really confusing on which ones you need. And our Docker file that we provide here um, is um, basically our current opinion of what um, the system dependency should be. It's captured there. So um, there's after the container is created, there's uh, the possibility to use Docker Run to run these containers directly. However, there's still a little bit of extra setup that you need to do in order to really do that. And that's captured in this run.sh script. So although we're using Docker Run, we need some kind of ADB key, public key, to um, communicate with the emulator. 
and privileged for running with KVM acceleration, along with publishing um, two ports, 5556 and 5555. So the first port is to enable gRPC, which is needed for the remote streaming. And the second port is your standard ADV port. And so uh, I can then invoke run.sh on the container I just created. Then, so the emulator is starting up and everything. However, in the background, uh, I have, in fact, started a different emulator. And I forward the ADB port over to my local Mac over here on port 5595. So ADB devices, it shows that there's a device here. And I'm looking for the key mu processes and activity manager, and there's nothing. That's because it's running on the remote machine. And in fact, it's also streaming via this WebRTC thing. So uh, this is like a standard web page. Um, this is working using a turn server, um, connecting to the HTTPS port on our server. At the same time, it's available as a active device. And so the log cap over here that you're seeing is actually from that device. Wait, hold on. That's actually not true. Um, I, <laughs> I need to switch it over. Uh, okay. All right. Anyway, so I've been trying some. So I'm, I'm taking some tests from the uh, Android testing samples. So part of these are UI tests, and they do a lot of clicks and other automated interactions. And it can be useful to see what happens when you um, try to run these tests on, on the emulator in, in real time. So I've started a test up, and you see the test log on your local machine, but the test itself is running remotely, and um, you're able to see what's going on as it happens, which can be valuable in some cases. So. Um, yeah, that's, uh, the, the test is running, and um, we, we're getting the lock cap from, from the remote machine. And yeah, that, I think that just about sums up what I want to demonstrate for the uh, container scripts. Yeah. Back to the slides. Thank you. Cool. Yay, that works. <laughs> yeah. The most important is to select the correct emulator. So uh, what you have seen today is uh, two things. The first is we're continuing to uh, basically improve the Android emulator infrastructure. And uh, as I've said, you know, the, uh, the newest features that we have launched is the ARM emulation. And we would love to hear feedback from the community uh, on what works and actually, very importantly, you know, what doesn't for you uh, so that we can continue to improve that uh, infrastructure. The second is around um, the uh, basically setting up the Android emulator in your continuous testing environment, you know, in terms of uh, creating the docker image or remotely debugging for our WebRTC. That's still, I still, my mind is still blown by that functionality. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you would like to find out more uh, about all of these. Um, so we have actually published, or actually Frank have published a blog uh, on continuous testing uh, with the Android emulator. So you can use your favorite search engine to find this blog. <laughs> And with that, thank you very much, and we'll be available for questions later. Thank you very much. <laughs>